And I'd like to welcome every one of you sitting here with us and those of you joining us electronically. Uh, we are uh, moving on in our uh, series of the, uh, what do you call them, the succinct S prophets? Succinct prophets. Yes, the succinct prophet, prophets. Uh, we are moving into Zephaniah, correct? Excellent. Correct. Zephaniah. I put my notes in my book. Uh, Mark Salomon is going to be continuing uh, this week as he starts this new book. So we bless, uh, ask the Lord to bless you as you come. Well, as Tommy said, we're up to Zephaniah, which chronologically is the eighth, at least we think, it's the eighth of the so-called minor prophets. The chronology is not always as evident as we might like it to be. One of the things sometimes when we approach studying the Bible is that we tend to look at the Bible as one book, and it is, but it isn't. It's 66 books, and it's not one monolithic book in terms of language, in terms of chronology, in terms of cultural background. And so it's important as we hit these books to remember to kind of get behind that background and look at things. To me, Zephaniah represents a change or at least the beginning of a shift in the focus of the so-called minor prophets, the succinct prophets. If you think about the seven that we've covered so far, and we're not going to review all seven, obviously, that'd take our whole morning, but we started with Obadiah, who was probably chronologically the first. He focused on the foreign country of Edom, and then the next six that we looked at were looking at a time in general of a divided nation, in other words, a northern kingdom of Israel and a southern kingdom of Judah. Now, true that Jonah and Nahum focused on Assyria, but that focus had to do with Assyria's relationship to those nations. And there was a lot of focus in those earlier prophets on the northern kingdom of Israel. The northern kingdom of Israel was probably more significant than you and I realize. It was larger than Judah. It was in a location that made it less compact, more subject to interaction with foreign powers, and most of the time it was stronger than Judah. In fact, you may remember when we were looking at Jonah, we saw it was a time of blessing even though Israel was under an evil king and acting very much as an evil nation, God was blessing them. They were wealthy, they were powerful, at least relatively speaking. We wrapped up with Nahum last week. Now, Nahum comes after the fall, but as we said, Nahum is kind of a tag-along to Jonah, a sequel, because he's wrapping up the story with Assyria. So now we get to Zephaniah, and we've made that complete shift because the northern kingdom of Israel is gone, never to be heard from again. The people are scattered and by and large lost, and I emphasize by and large lost because we hear this title, the Ten Lost Tribes, sometimes, and there are all sorts of speculations out there as to who the Ten Lost Tribes may be. God knows for sure. They weren't completely lost in that we know some of the exiles did make it to Jerusalem and Judah and escape. In fact, evidence for that can be found in the New Testament, because if you recall the prophetess Hannah, who lived in the temple, she wasn't from Judah and she wasn't from Benjamin. We're told she was of the tribe of Asher. So some had undoubtedly made it, but by and large, we see a shift as we get to Zephaniah and the succeeding prophets in that we are shifting to a focus that will be on Judah and Jerusalem. And with that focus comes a shift to even more ap ap apocalyptic literature. I used to know how to say that word. In fact, if I look at my Bible the way it laid out, Zephaniah, it gives a heading for each chapter, and the heading of the first chapter is Day of Judgment on Judah. The heading for chapter 2 is Judgment on Judah's Enemies, and the heading for chapter 3 is Woe to Jerusalem and the Nations. So we can see there rather quickly what the focus of Zephaniah is going to be. And to be perfectly honest, this is going to be the focus of Scripture and the focus of God's plan for the next 2,600 and however many years since Zephaniah, this is where we are. 
There is a nation called Israel today, but you know, we don't call those people the Israelites. We may call them the Israelis, but even that term comes with a qualifier. There are Arab Israelis and there are Jewish Israelis. The focus today, as it has been for quite a while, but was not in those books that we looked at before Zephaniah, is Jewish in nature. And you probably know where that term comes from, and if you don't, I'm going to explain it anyway. The term Jew, which has passed through several languages to get down to English as Jew, goes back to the term Yehud. And a Yehudim, which is the plural of Yehud, is a descendant of Judah, Yehuda. And that word has a lot of different meanings to people because of how things have gone through history. As we said, today we talk about a Jewish Israeli. That would be an Israeli, not an Arab, not a Muslim. He's Jewish in some way, sense, or form, whether it's religiously Jewish, whether the family traces back to somewhere in the Bible of Judah. In the biblical times, now that we're up to Zephaniah, a Jew would be an inhabitant of the nation of Judah, whether or not that individual was actually descended from Judah, or Benjamin, or Simeon, or Levi, or whoever that... So that name would morph a little bit. But the point is, we are focused now on the Jew, on Judah, on Jerusalem. And that focus on Jerusalem, dare I say, is very important. And I know Zephaniah 3 is not part of my text today, but I do want to go just to the very first verse of Zephaniah 3. Well, you know what? Let's pray first. This introduction's kind of rambling, isn't it? Let's, let's get ourselves before the Lord, ask for His guidance. Heavenly Father, as we start into Zephaniah, make things clear if they don't seem clear and open our hearts to what you would have us to see in this book that if we're honest, we probably haven't spent much time in our life reading or studying but it is in your word you have preserved it for us. So may we focus on the things you have for us today. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. The reason I do want to just look at Zephaniah 3 quickly is because I want to compare it to something in Daniel. And, and by the way, in fact, before I do that, I should mention Zephaniah and Daniel. You say, what does Daniel have to do with this? Well, Daniel is probably born around the time Zephaniah is prophesying, and they're probably related. In Zephaniah 1, we get the word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah. Probably recognize that name. In the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. Now, we cannot prove it with absolute certainty, but it seems fairly likely that this Hezekiah would be the Hezekiah that we know from the scriptures as king of Judah. The author presumably Zephaniah, doesn't go into any further detail, so it would seem that he expects his readers to recognize. He stops the genealogy at that point, essentially saying, I don't have to go back any further because you know who I'm talking about. So probably this refers to Hezekiah the king. That is not without potential differences and difficulties, and we're not going to get into all the details about that. But most likely, this means that Zephaniah is the great-great-grandson of Hezekiah. I think I counted that right for the greats. As such, he is perhaps not royalty, but at least nobility. Well, you may recall something about Daniel. We're going to jump back to Daniel real quick and mention him. The king, in verse 3 of Daniel 1, ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in who was no defect, who were good-looking, etc. I won't read the whole detail. Among this, them from the sons of Judah were Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Nobody ever remembers those names. Everybody remembers Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But point being... Daniel and Zephaniah are probably coming from the same familial line and indeed probably contemporaries for a while, although Zephaniah would have been older and perhaps even knew each other in the land as they would have been related before Daniel is taken into captivity. So there's some overlap there, and that's the reason I wanted to mention them as we look just at Zephaniah 3, 1 quickly. Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the tyrannical city. Guess what city we're talking about? Rebellious, defiled, and tyrannical. Well, gosh, that's just really complimentary there, isn't it? Now look at Daniel 9. Daniel 9 and verse 24. We're going to speak about the same city. And it begins, 
Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city. Same city? Did I say it was the same city? Rebellious, defiled, tyrannical, holy. Now, I dare say that we don't typically make any of those first three words synonyms to the word holy, do we? Because sometimes we don't think about the word holy correctly. We think that holy should mean perfect, free from sin, righteous. But what is the root to holy? It is set apart. And so the first thing I wanted to mention here, and I apologize to uh, you, Thomas, if you were going to deal with this in Zephaniah 3 next week, but Jerusalem was set apart for God even while it was rebellious and defiled and tyrannical and whatever other evil word you want to put in there. Jerusalem was still the city set apart to God. It didn't mean that they were perfect. <laughs> Read your Bible lately? Far from it. I heard somebody chuckle out there. Far from perfect, and yet still holy, still set apart, as is everyone in this room and anywhere else who knows Christ as Savior. Holy, set apart, but in this life not yet perfected, and sad to say, probably sometimes still rebellious and defiled, aren't we? So a reminder there as we get into Zephaniah and his focus where he's going is for all the things that are going to be said about Jerusalem and Judah and even its enemies, God has taken a region, a people, an area and set them apart and they are called holy, even if through the actions we may frequently think of them as anything but. That's the background to the book of Zephaniah as Zephaniah writes perhaps well aware that this is going to happen, likely within his lifetime, likely not far after the time that he is preaching his prophecy. We don't know the exact timing, and I've seen some scholars debate with various reasons of why he may have been speaking before the reforms of Josiah, which come around 622, 621 B.C., or after those reforms. Daniel's taken into captivity to Babylon around 605 B.C. So if he's prophesying after the reforms of Josiah, it's not long at all. And even if he's prophesying before, Josiah becomes king around 640, just about 35 years before Daniel goes into captivity. So it's really not long at all, regardless. I know to some of you sitting here, 35 years seems like a long time. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Theo and Chloe. But <laughs> most of us can remember things from 35 years ago, and sometimes it doesn't seem that long ago, does it? 35 years is not a long time, as some of you may think, but it can be a long time. So anyhow, the background of Zephaniah, I think, is very important to understand that as we are shifting toward this focus of Jerusalem and Judah and apocalyptic literature and the day of the Lord. We're going to see that term popping up in this book and it's a significant term now Joel also dealt with that if you recall from the study in Joel the term the day of the Lord arises in Joel and in fact Joel gives us some great information on understanding the day of the Lord because Joel compares a locust plague with the day of the Lord you might say that the locust plague is the small d day of the Lord and there's a big d day of the Lord coming helps us to understand but I just want to jump up to Zephaniah 1 7 quickly as we begin to look at the concept of the day of the Lord be silent before the Lord for the day of the Lord is near for the Lord has prepared a sacrifice he has consecrated his guests we're gonna see a repeat of the day of the Lord in verse 14 near is the great day of the Lord there's an additional adjective for us near and coming quickly listen the day of the Lord in it the warrior cries out bitterly a day of wrath is that day a day of trouble and distress a day of destruction and desolation a day of darkness and gloom a day of clouds and thick darkness oh, that sounds like a good day to be part of doesn't it is it any wonder that Oh, which rabbi was it? I can't remember now which rabbi it was, but one of the rabbis in proclaiming the coming of the Messiah, the birth pangs of the Messiah, a term that Jesus used, 
said, let him come, but let my eyes not see him. He did not want to be part of this day. Perhaps he had been reading Zephaniah recently. And he looked and said, I don't want to be part of this day. The day of the Lord is a concept that we have to be a little bit careful about because there are multiple days of the Lord. As I said, you know, little d or big d. And so Joel would use the example of the locust plague. It was sent not so much as the day of the Lord, but as a picture, a small picture, a representation of the day of the Lord. A model, if you will, of the day of the Lord, because a model, as somebody once joked, is a small replica of the real thing. So it becomes clear quickly that Zephaniah is talking about something a little bit larger. The day of the Lord. And understanding that Hebrew word day is very significant. And I'm pretty sure I talked about this here once, but I think it's been a number of years. And so who knows how many of you were here and who knows how many of you remember. So I'm going to get into that again, even though I think I did cover it here once. The concept of day in the Hebrew language. Now we're not talking right now about the 24-hour day, but the 24-hour day also gives us a picture, a model, if you will, a small example of the real thing. What do you know about the Jewish day? Or to be specific, how it falls on the calendar. When does the Jewish day begin? It begins at night. To be specific, it begins at sundown, when things get dark. And that goes all the way back to Genesis 1. You may recall it says, and the evening and the morning were the first day, the second day, etc. It didn't say morning and evening every time. It says evening and morning. And all throughout Jewish history, they would understand the day to begin when the sun went down. 6 p.m., give or take, much of the year, obviously, for us here, it's more like 9 p.m. right now, and then in the winter, it seems like it pretty much all day, it's night. But <clears throat> we understand, to use rough terms, that the day starts around 6 p.m. and ends around 6 p.m. the next day, not midnight the way we think of it, which is a somewhat arbitrary thing, but doesn't matter. But what is the point of this? The Jewish day begins in the dark and then goes to the light, always, every day, no exceptions. Well, maybe some small exceptions. Jesus was on the cross, things went dark for three hours when it should have been bright daylight. But in any normal day, it starts out dark, the sun goes down, and it's 12 hours dark, give or take, depending on time of year, and then it's 12 hours light again, give or take, depending on time of the year. The day always starts with the night, the first half of the day is night. We don't reckon a day that way. But we should understand that in Scripture, the day is always thought of that way, <laughs> beginning with night and then transitioning to light. Well, what are some things that night and darkness represent in Scripture? They represent sin judgment upon sin, times of tribulation and turmoil and distress. <laughs> Many of the things that we read there in Zechariah, what did we read? A day of wrath is that day, a day of trouble and distress, a day of destruction and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. But how often do all 24 hours of the day remain dark? Now, sometimes we get enough clouds that it kind of feels like it, but no, the sun's out there. And it gets at least a little lighter even on the worst weather day, doesn't it? We still have daylight. We still have daytime. We can still see some things. And there is always going to be that opportunity. And there is always going to be that change. And I didn't mean to flip back to Habakkuk there. I went a little far there. And there is always going to be that time of restoration. And so when we see some of the things that are happening, example, a verse I didn't read yet, but it was right before some things that I did read, verse 13 of Zephaniah 1, Moreover, their wealth will become plunder and their houses desolate. Yes, they will build houses but not inhabit them. 
and plant vineyards but not drink their wine, which by the way is a great verse indicating just how soon the judgment was going to come after Zephaniah's time of prophecy. You're going to build a house, but you're not going to live in it. You're going to plant a vineyard, but by the time that thing grows and there are grapes and you stomp them out and put them in the wine press, you're not going to be there anymore. You're not going to get to drink them. Somebody else is going to enjoy that. It was coming soon. But we should also recognize that this day of the Lord, this day of judgment, was not yet the great day of the Lord when we think in terms of future times. See, there's going to be a restoration. Implicit in that idea of the day of the Lord is if it begins with nighttime, eventually the sun comes up. Eventually it is light. And light represents restoration, righteousness, holiness, if you will, more in the terms that we think of associating it with righteousness. There was always going to be that promise that when the day of the Lord fell, repentance and restoration would come eventually. Now, there was no guarantee in the prophetic idea of day of the Lord that night and day would be roughly equal amounts of time. And in fact, as we look toward the future, that's a pretty neat deal because if we look toward the day of the Lord yet to come in the future, seven years of tribulation followed by a thousand years of millennial kingdom, that's a pretty nice balance. That's a lot better than the other way around, wouldn't you say? Well, for those of Judah and Jerusalem, in terms of an earthly kingdom, their balance wasn't going to be too great. But they were going to come back. And Zephaniah's presumed relative and for a while contemporary Daniel would be one to proclaim that in the verse that we read, Daniel 9.24, and what was coming. You're going to come back and there's going to be a time but it's still the holy city. It's still the holy people, unholy though they may act. The time was coming. And so everything we read in Zephaniah has to be understood that Zephaniah is primarily focusing on the nighttime. Not because he was a nattering nabob of negativity or whatever that <laughs> phrase was, but because that was what God called him to proclaim. People who are bound in their sin and heading gas pedal floored towards judgment don't need to hear about how good things are going to be in the restoration. They need to hear about the danger they're heading toward right now. And that, by the way, is why as we study the so-called minor prophets, we receive these warnings time and time and time and time and time again. Because God knew that they didn't need a positive message. I'm okay, you're okay, everybody's okay. They weren't okay, and that wasn't going to do them any good. It's when you're not okay that you need to hear that you're not okay. You go to the doctor, and he says, everything's fine, but you've got a tumor growing? What good would that doctor be? Oh, he's, pre he's preaching the power of positive thinking, or whatever they call it. No, give it to me straight, doc. I can take it. That's what we need to hear, and that's what the people needed to hear. And so Zephaniah is doing that. And by the way, shut up and listen. Remember that verse 7? Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. Sometimes you just need to stop and listen. Because you're getting a warning. And you better heed the warning. You go straight through that red light. Might not be too good for you on the other end. You might want to heed that warning. Well, the nation of Judah, the people of Jerusalem... They didn't have any cars yet, but they were heading straight toward a red light, full blast, and they were going to run right through it. So the word of the Lord, getting back to the beginning here, which came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of, Jer king of Judah. I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will remove man and beast. I will remove the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the ruins along with the wicked. And I will cut off man from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. Minor judgment. No. Ze Zephaniah has a way of getting right into it, doesn't he? Or should I say the Lord has a way of getting right into it. Zephaniah just didn't bother to give us any 
commentary leading up to it. What does this remind you of? Your mind jumped to the Noahic flood? I know mine does. All life on earth wiped out save eight human beings and the animals on the ark. And I guess the fish did pretty well during that time. But other than that, oh, by the way, there's an interesting thing here too, if you notice. The order of verse 3. I will remove man and beast. I will remove the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea. Do you notice anything interesting about the order named there? It's a reversal of creation. Man is created last, the beasts, the animals created before, and the birds and the fish before that. So essentially, the prophecy here that Zephaniah relates on behalf of the Lord seems to be the Lord saying, I'm going in to rewind. We're going back through what we did here in this destruction. And everything's going to be affected, but who's going to be affected first? Man. Because man is the one responsible. Our sin causes the animals and the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and everything through creation to be impacted, to be sure. But we are, for lack of a better term, the target of the judgment. Humanity is the focal point of the day of the Lord, of the judgment coming. And effects on anything besides humanity, whether it be animals, fish, birds, trees, the earth itself, those effects are secondary to the impact upon humanity. And if you've read the seals and the bowls and everything else that goes into Revelation lately, it's going to be a pretty heavy impact on all of the above. As we said, Zephaniah starts to really turn the direction toward apocalyptic literature because, well, and because, and this is human speculation, how many prophets cried out to the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, and watched them not listen? It's as though God says, okay, I'm going to get even more serious with you, Judah. Look at what I'm going to cry out. And yet... The inhabitants of Judah would sit there, and we know from other passages, they would say, God delivered us before. His temple's here in Jerusalem. He'll deliver us again. After all, it's the holy city. Well, Daniel did write it was the holy city, but Zephaniah wrote a few different things, didn't he? They were putting their trust in the wrong things. He's going to remove all that, and he continues, So I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the names of the idolatrous priests along with the priests. Some thoughts here. Judah will not be spared from what will happen to humanity as a whole. Judah does not deserve to be spared from what will happen to humanity as a whole. Being holy, that is, being set apart for God, does not make one immune to judgment if one deserves judgment. Now, thanks be to God. Those who are in Christ, well, we'll sit at a whole different judgment. We are not going to be judged according to our evil works because Christ's blood wiped those away, cast them as far as the east is from the west, and universally speaking, I don't know how far it is from one end to the other, but it's plenty far. And our judgment will be much different. Thanks be to God for that. Nonetheless, there is a judgment of evil deeds coming. And I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the names of the idolatrous priests along with the priests. That almost sounds a little redundant. But that must mean there's two categories of priests here. There's idolatrous priests, and along with them, the other priests don't get an adjective. But I think just from process of elimination, there would be the idolatrous priests and the non-idolatrous priests. Neither one's going to escape judgment. Did you catch that? 
the non-idolatrous priests with the idolatrous priests, if I may rewrite the terms just a little bit. When the judgment would come upon Judah and upon Jerusalem, the righteous were not going to be spared. Daniel and his three friends exiled into Babylon. From all evidence that we have, they were righteous, God-fearing individuals before and after the exile. They weren't spared. King Josiah was on the throne for some 31 years at this point in time, shortly before everything fell apart. King Josiah was a righteous man who instituted reforms. Sad to say, most of the people did not follow his reforms, or at least if they followed them, they followed them externally but not internally. But the righteous king could not save the nation, could not save the people. And the good would be swept away with the bad. Something to remember about God's judgment. You are not guaranteed immunity from God's judgment on the world, on a nation, on a group of people as a whole, even if you are the one individual standing out. Jeremiah would be another illustration. Jeremiah would live through this judgment, and well, he had it pretty rough some of the time. We are not guaranteed a life without trial and tribulation. It is the final judgment that we are looking forward to escaping. Those who bow down on the housetops to the host of heaven, verse 5, and those who bow down and swear to the Lord and yet swear by Milcom, that may be another word for Molech, that was the deity, if you recall, who required child sacrifice through the fire. Considered very evil. And yet, putting the fire aside, how much different is our culture today? And those who have turned back from following the Lord and those who have not sought the Lord or inquired of Him. Two categories. Those who turned back from following the Lord and those who haven't tried yet. Same judgment. Along with the previously mentioned priests. Along with those following the idols of Baal, Molech, whoever else they were following during that day. Along with those who weren't following anybody. When judgment comes, it's one judgment. It wasn't going to be pick and choose. It wasn't going to be you're categorized this way and you're categorized this way and you're categorized this way. The judgment was going to be thorough and complete and on the entire nation. And so many just couldn't believe that it would happen because after all they were God's chosen people. In fact, we're going to get to another prophet shortly, who couldn't believe that God would send those evil Babylonians to judge Judah, his people. We're not too far down the road from that study. They just couldn't accept that idea. But we serve a holy God, and now that definition of holy fills the ideas of righteousness and perfection and must be separate from sin. And a holy God could not continue to abide even His holy people and His holy city, and that's that other definition of holy, set apart. <laughs> Got to be careful using that word. Who knew it was so tricky, right? God could not abide and protect them forever from the results of their sin. And when I say God could not, it doesn't mean that he didn't have the strength. God's arm is not shortened that he cannot save. We run into that a few times in Scripture. But because of his holy nature, he must not continue to abide sin. And that's why books like Zephaniah become so apop apocalyptic. I'm having the worst time with that word today have to find another word that's easier to pronounce. I can't think of a good synonym right now. It was getting to that point, and it was close by. 
See, if you see somebody who's walking slowly and they're a mile away from danger, you're not going to get too concerned. You're not going to start screaming and jumping and shouting at the top of your lungs. But if you see somebody suddenly turn the wrong way down a one-way street, that's happened to me each of the last two weeks, you yell! Or at least you should! Because they're going headlong into danger. And by the time of Zephaniah, they've got that turn signal on and they're heading the wrong way. And so we're going to see some yelling here, if you will. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. Do you stop and think about the second half of that verse that we didn't really touch on yet? That, that verse 7? He consecrated his guests. Another of those set-apart ideas. But if he prepared a sacrifice and set apart the guests, this is not a positive. Ordinarily, we would probably think about consecrating the guests, at least in scriptural terms, because I dare say that none of us have ever said we consecrated our house guests who were coming over. And if you did, you probably have some interesting traditions I'd like to hear more about. But in this term of consecrating his guests, set apart for what? Sacrifice. Yeah, you wouldn't want to be a house guest there, would you? Then it will come about on the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes, the king's sons, and all who clothe themselves with foreign garments. And I will punish on that day all who leap on the temple threshold, who fill the house of the Lord with violence and deceit. And that leaping on the temple threshold, there's a couple different terms I've heard here for what this may mean. This may mean those who are in the temple, but in their wild celebrations, not to God, but to others, they're dancing in out-of-control forms. Or it may be, mean those who leap to the temple to take advantage and reap dishonest gain. Jesus would deal with that several hundred years later, but it wasn't a new thing in Jesus' day. Either way, it is not representing an emotional outburst of positivity toward the worship of God. It is representing something that defiles and defames the temple of God. That very place, by the way, that was set apart and made Jerusalem so special and a holy city, the fact that God had chosen to localize his presence there and put that building there. Oh yes, it wasn't about the building. If it was about the building, then Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't have succeeded. If it was about the building, it wouldn't have had a repeat in 70 A.D. with the Romans. Have you seen that building lately? <laughs> Who's been over to Israel or seen pictures? <laughs> Where, where's the building? It's not there. Oh, yeah, there's a nice big retaining wall there. The retaining wall is just holding up a big mound of dirt. Oh, yeah, there are stones from Solomon's temple. You don't go up to see them. You go down to see them. That temple was <laughs> okay, not having much luck with this mic the last couple weeks. Are we good now? Zephaniah's point here wasn't to demonstrate his knowledge of Jerusalem, although this probably does point us back toward the idea that he is one of the king's descendants. He is familiar with Jerusalem. That's his city. But it's pointing out the destruction that's coming on the various areas, especially the market district. All who weigh out silver will be cut off. Your wealth's not going to save you. You're one of the rich merchants. You got lots of silver in your bank account or whatever, however they kept the silver in those days. 
no use, no benefit. And if you do hide, what does the next verse say? It will come about at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps and I will punish the men who are stagnant in spirit. There's not a hiding place. You, I think, get the mental picture of searching Jerusalem with lamps. You think of a TV show going through some area with lights to try to find the character who's hiding. Might be that the bad guy's looking for the good guys, the vice versa. But you get that mental picture, at least I do, of a dark city, but those searchlights and you're going through and you're going to find them. God says, I'm not going to miss anybody, especially those who say I'm not going to do anything, who say in their hearts, this is the end of verse 12, by the way, the Lord will not do good or evil. Imagine that. An inhabitant of Judah, a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the Twelve. Someone who all his life has known the ancient stories of creation, of Noah, of Abraham, of deliverance from Egypt. But someone... No, the Lord's not going to do anything. Whether it's atheism, agnosticism, or just plain apathy. That's how a lot of the people we know live their lives. Whether they think there is no God, or they're not sure if there's a God, or they just think, well, God's up there, but he's just doing whatever, nothing. Nothing. Apparently, that was the attitude of many in Judah. Yeah, there's this God that we and our fathers have believed in for hundreds or thousands of years, but he doesn't actually do anything. He's just there. Nothing's going to happen. They had the attitude that they could just continue and every day would be the same as the next and there was going to be no change and no judgment. Nothing was going to come. And it wasn't long. The day of the Lord was near. Moreover, their wealth will become plunder. As we said before, wealth was not going to spare anybody. Their houses desolate. Yes, they will build houses, but not inhabit them and plant vineyards, but not drink their wine because, and then the word because isn't in there, but it fits, near is the great day of the Lord, near and coming very quickly. Now this is one of the reasons I speak about Zephaniah as apocalyptic literature. Because we're seeing another shift here. See, everything about Scripture is designed to point us toward God's ultimate plan. Everything about Scripture is designed to point us toward Jesus Christ. But of course, Christ is the one who fulfills the ultimate plan, and he fulfills it in every possible way. Not just soteriology, salvation that is, but also judgment in the end. Think about the book of Revelation. A book with seven seals is shown to John, and John weeps because no one is found who can open the seals. And then who is found? Christ, the Lamb, who takes away the sins of the world. Because while he may have completed our salvation when he cried to tell us to on the cross, he wasn't done yet. And as he breaks open the seals and judgment is poured out on the earth, it's the wrath of God and the wrath of the Lamb. Jesus is also implicit and completely involved in every step of judgment. And so when we see these judgments in the Old Testament whether it's the judgment of the flood, judgment of plagues on Egypt, judgment that sends a plague during David's day because he counted the people, judgment that sends the north into exile and removes them permanently, judgment upon Judah, not once but twice into exile. All of these judgments and all of the ones I didn't mention are to point us toward the final judgment, the great day of the Lord. Now, as Zephaniah writes, I can't stand here and tell you how much understanding he would have had of that. 
He didn't have the book of Daniel yet or the book of Revelation or a number of other books. What direct revelation he had from God would only be speculative. And he may not have completely understood that his words were hearkening toward a yet future judgment as we speak in the year 2022. But it is there. Near is the great day of the Lord, near and coming very quickly. And if that could be written over 2,600 years ago, then we should appreciate today how near it could possibly be. The timing of the day of the Lord, I do not pretend to know it. Make that very clear. The scripture says no one knows but the Father alone. So when you hear some guy out there claiming that he's got a date he can stick on it, understand what he's really saying. We may chuckle a little at it, but it's a serious thing. That individual is claiming a position to which he has no right. And there's a reason they've all been wrong so far. I've told people before, I've said, I don't know for sure when the Lord's going to come, but I do know one thing. When some guy predicts a date, I know that one's wrong. I know he won't come that day. I don't know about any other day, but I know that one. But it is near. If it was near 2,600 years ago, imagine how near it is today. Understand the idea of near here does not mean close, as in you and I might say, well, tomorrow we're going to do this, that, that other thing. It's close. It means imminent. It's going to come. It is inevitable and it can come at any time. See, you and I live in a day and age where my best understanding of the prophecy of the scripture says that the Lord's return could be at any time. I do not believe there is one single event prophesied in scripture that has yet to occur and must occur before the Lord Jesus meets us in the clouds. And that means something. That means a lot of things. But that should mean something to us. Zephaniah was going to get the message out. Outside of a brief blip of genealogy, he gets right to the message because he doesn't have much time. Well, you and I might not have much time to get the message out. As much as we might look forward to meeting the Lord in the air, once we meet the Lord in the air, we can't warn anybody anymore. The second that happens, our opportunity is done. The second that happens, you can't yell, look out! It'll be too late for us to let anybody know. And that's why a book like Zephaniah gets more apocalyptic. Because the time is near. And the time remains near. The time is nearer. Heavenly Father, as we Continue this study in your minor prophets. Help us to see how near the time is. Not that we can measure it out in hours or days or months or years. But help us to understand the imminence. And with the imminence, help us to understand the urgency. And so, Lord, may we be impressed, convicted if necessary, by the words that we study. And may we grow closer to you and more aggressively doing the things that you would have us to do before that day. We ask it in Christ's precious name. Amen.